Okay, folks. So Lambert is going to take the quizzes up and while we finish class, he will get it alphabetically sorted and I will start grading as soon as I can, which might be 10 minutes after the class ends. But I will let you know when the quizzes are graded and I'll send the solution with a grading template. And if you have issues, don't take it up with the TAs. They have absolutely nothing to do with this. Take it up with me. Right? So you will get the quizzes. So I won't send the solution out till the quizzes are done. The reason being, if I send the solution out now, you're going to read it and assume the worst and it might not be the best idea. So it'll come back to you sooner than you think. So you can check the quizzes, check the solutions, make sure I haven't screwed up. The reason I ask that you write your name on the back is when the quizzes are done, have your attention please, when the quizzes are done, I will put them outside the front entrance to the finance department. I'll give you very specific directions. If you've never been to the finance department, how to find it, face down. So if you have privacy issues with that, let me know. I will hold your quiz back in my office. But I can't think of an efficient way to return quizzes in any other way. Right? I can't hand them out in class. That would take up a whole class. So if you don't want your quizzes in that pile, let me know. I will hold them back. But then you'll have to you know then your access to the quiz will have to wait till you find me in my office, which might not be till tomorrow or day after. But let me know pretty early but if you want that to happen. So I didn't think there were any surprises on that quiz. It was, if you work through the past, if you looked at the past quizzes, the language is the same, the problems are similar. They're not exactly the same prompts. That would defeat the whole point. But um, I will not, you know, the one part I hate about this first quiz is the multiple choice questions. I spend more time writing four multiple choice questions than I do writing the rest of the quiz. I absolutely did. But there is no other way you can check corporate governance, right? What can I ask you in quantitative terms? Hopefully, there was no ambiguity. I checked it out with a few people before I sent it to make sure that. But I think there was only one answer to each question that was the best answer. Hopefully, your answer and mine will match up. But remember, it's half a point. If this is the kind of thing that makes you go crazy and you disagree with my answer, I'll make a deal with you. If you can back your answer up with en enough ammunition, you know, I'll give you the half point because the very fact that you will go to that trouble tells me that it's worth the effort. So I'm not going to take my stand and say, this is the only right answer. So if you have an alternate answer, but I need backing. So let's go back to where we were at the, at the start of, at the end of last class, we were talking about Disney's bottom-up beta, okay? So tell me again what the advantage of a bottom-up beta is. Why, instead of a regression beta, which is what everybody uses for a company, what are some of the advantages of a bottom-up beta? Give me any one, no, one advantage. Where you take the betas from the business you're in and take the averages, What's the advantage of a bottom-up beta versus a regression beta? You can pass if you want. No. You want to try? Pass. How about you, Arena? It's by one is you can break down by business. Remember for Disney, instead of having one beta for the company, I gave you a beta for the individual businesses. That is critical if you're a multi-business company, right? To get a cost of equity. Any others? And tell me why it's more accurate. What's the advantage? It's a statistical advantage, a law of large numbers. The individual regressions are noisy. It's one slice of history. God knows what happens to that slice. When you average across 50 companies, magic happens. You get 50 crappy betas, but the average of 50 crappy betas is magically precise. It's really not magic. Your mistakes average out. Anything else? It's more precise. It gives you betas by business. Can companies' business mix change over time? Absolutely. The advantage of using a bottom-up beta is you reflect your company as it is today, 
rather than as it was over the last five years. There's one final advantage, and we'll come back and we will talk about this more today. Let's say you're looking at a privately owned business. Remember, I gave you that option on the project that you could take a family business or a privately owned business. If the only way you can get a beta is through a regression, you're going to get stuck, right? Why? You don't have past prices. There's no returns. If something is not traded, there are going to be no returns. Bottom up betas give you a way around that problem saying, look, I don't. So, you know, Reddit so IPO is coming up, right? Let's say you wanted to value Reddit. One of the things you need is a beta and a cost of equity and a cost of capital. You can go to Bloomberg and type in Reddit and say, give me the beta, but you're going to get a blank page because Reddit is not publicly traded. I don't understand this fixation people have with regression betas, or maybe I do. It allows you to blame Bloomberg or blame the regression for a beta that doesn't go wrong. This makes you take ownership of your beta. Ownership in what sense you pick the businesses and the weights and you come up with the beta. You can't say the beta came to me from somewhere else. It's your beta. So I'm going to complete the discussion of bottom-up betas with my other publicly traded companies. I went through Disney in, in, in detail. But let me take Vale, Brazilian mining company. Vale, again, if you look at its annual report, broke themselves down into four businesses, metals and mining, iron ore, fertilizers, and logistics. Again, you take what you can get. I have no idea what the dividing line is between metals and mining and iron, but clearly they've drawn the line. I went global, marriage. Remember the two tactics, you have to get a big sample. One is you go up and down the food chain, looking for other companies that are in the same business, or you go global. Here I went global because if you're a mining company, you're competing in a global market. You produce iron ore, you sell it into a global market. So the advantage of going global is I get very big sample sizes on each of these. 693 companies in my global specialty chemical business. I get the unleavened beta for the business and I want to you know, torture you by taking 693 companies looking up their betas. But remember, we talked about the statistical choices you have to make, median or aggregated numbers. But the end game is I want a beta for the four businesses. While they broke their revenues down by business. And since betas at least have to be value weighted averages, I try to get a value. That's what I'm trying to do. And I take the revenues and I multiply by that multiple of revenues that companies typically trade at. While I'm going through this class, if you get flashbacks to the quiz and say, oh my God, I didn't do that, let it go, right? There's nothing you can do at this stage, you know, because you're saying, oh my God, there was an EV to sales. Was I supposed to use it? Yeah, it gives you an estimate of value. It's not a deal break of used revenue weights, but clearly it's less good than using value weights. My value weights basically give me a company that's not surprisingly 76% iron ore, iron ore, 17% metals and mining, about 5.39% fertilizers and about 2% logistics. Only rule again is the weights have to add up to 100%. Your question? No. The weighted average beta that I get for Vale's operating businesses is 0.84. That's my unlevered beta. I applied that to equity ratio. And here, remember for Disney, I tried to allocate the debt across businesses saying, why aren't you trying your all of these businesses are capital intensive. I don't think I can slice and dice the data. I don't think I need to. I give them all the same debt to equity ratio. I end up with a levered beta for each of the four businesses. Risk-free rate is the risk-free rate because I'm doing everything in US dollar terms. My equity risk premium is a weighted average of the businesses therein. And basically my cost of equity in dollar terms for each of the four businesses and for Vale as a company is in the last column. So this is the analogous to what I did for Disney, but it's in a sense a simpler business. The, di the differences across businesses are not as wide. Justin? No, it's, it's an aggregated number, just like the debt to equity. Either you can use the median or the aggregated number. Don't Try to steer away from weighted averages of ratios for the simple reason that if you get a large, I mean, every software company then will end up with Microsoft's number, right? You want, you want to avoid that. So either the median or the aggregated, and that's not a financial choice, it's a statistical choice. 
everything I've done here is in dollar terms. And I gave you the rationale in two, you know, when you look at Vale in 2013, it's a commodity company. Commodity companies across the world report their numbers in US dollars. You look at BP's financials, it's a UK company, it's in US dollars. Why? Because the commodity business is a dollarized business. Everybody sells into a market. I mean, that's up for debate now as to whether the dollar would remain the currency, the global currency of a commodity, but for the moment, it's still there. That's why I chose to do everything in dollars. Let me do a little tangent. Let's suppose I wanted to do everything in nominal reals. Remember, we said currency is a neutral element. Changing your currency should not change your analysis. But let's say I wanted to convert all of these numbers in real. So you know, this, the C, CFO of Vale actually was in this class 27 years ago. Uh, so let's suppose he calls you and he says, look, I want everything in, in reals. It's a national thing. We don't like dollarizing numbers. What do I need to do to convert these into, I mean, the material from the quiz should be fresh enough, right? So how do I convert these dollar numbers into, into real numbers? What do I need to bring in? I'm sorry, what, what? No, default, no, remember risk, default spread should be in every currency, right? You can't go away from risk by moving from one currency. What's the only thing currencies bring to the table? Differences in inflation, that's it, right? If I told you that the inflation rate in Brazil was 9% and the inflation rate, these are expected inflation rates, and the inflation rate in the US is 2%, then I can just add 7% of the number if I'm in a hurry. But if I want to do this right, I take my dollar cost equity, one, which is 11.23%, scale it up. So all this is doing is bringing the inflation effect on a compounded basis, and I come up with an 18.87% cost of equity for the company. I can do that for every business. Get comfortable moving across currencies, partly because we live in a world where you have to get comfortable with different currencies. You're sitting across the table from somebody who thinks in rupees and you think in dollars, you need to be able to adjust your thinking to rupees. And all that requires that you bring in that differential inflation into the number. So cost of equity in reais is basically going to be the cost of equity you got in dollar terms scaled up. Now I could have started from scratch if I wanted to. The other way to do this is instead of doing this last adjustment, Start with the risk-free rate that is in reais and do everything in reais. I would get roughly the same number, but it's a lot more work and I'm a lazy person, right? Given that you get the same answer, do everything in dollars, adjust to reais, adjust to pesos, you can adjust to any currency. Now with Tata Motors and Baidu, my life got a little simpler, partly because I made a decision that each of these companies was in only one business. Tata Motors was an automobile company. I considered breaking it down to luxury auto and mass market auto. Do you see why that might make a difference from a beta perspective? Which one should have a higher beta if you break businesses down to luxury? The luxury auto, because it's more discretionary. I gave up very quickly because there wasn't enough breakdown to be able to do that. And there weren't enough pure luxury auto companies to get a lot of large numbers working. So I broke, I basically got an unlevered beta for the automobile business, global automobile business, not Indian automobile companies. And there's a simple reason. I tried Indian automobile companies. I got a sample size of three. I think the law of large numbers requires large numbers. And three is not a large number. And here again, going global doesn't get, you know, you don't have to compromise anything. There were 80, I think there were 76 publicly traded auto, automobile companies. I got their unlevered beta. But once I got the unlevered beta 0.86, I used Tata Motors debt to equity ratio and Tata Motors tax rate. So it's always your company's numbers that you use to come up with the levered beta. Tata Motors, I was doing everything in rupee terms. And if you remember my rupee risk-free rate, where I took the government bond rate and cleaned up for it, was 6.57%. The bottom up beta I get is about one. I multiplied by the equity risk premium for Tata Motors. I would repeat cost of equity for Tata Motors. Final example, Baidu. What business is it in? It's, it's a search engine. Search engine is not a business. AI is not a business. Dot com is not a business. They're platforms. So the question we ask, what business are you in? The question we're asking is, how do you make money? 
how does Google make money on its search box? Ads. Basically, it's an advertising company. And that's something worth thinking about. And I wanted to start thinking about what business is Reddit in. Don't tell me it's a social media company again. Social media is a platform. You have to tell me how you convert them to revenues. Most social media companies, it's advertising. But can you have a social media company which is a subscription model? Absolutely. In this case, I looked at online advertising companies. I got the unlevered beta from those companies, which is 1.30. The debt to equity ratio is 5.23%. Baidu doesn't borrow very much money. And I used the Chinese corporate tax rate. So again, company-specific tax rate and debt to equity ratio. I get a levered beta for Baidu, 1.356. And in remember the or you want the cost of equity that I get is a risk-free rate in the local currency plus beta times the equity risk premium for so at this point, you have a template, right? So if you have a company, you can you should be able to estimate the cost of equity for that company by building up. There's one final company I want to bring into the mix. And here you're going to notice that I'm going to do something slightly different. And I want you to focus on what I'm doing differently because it's going to give you some insight. None of you should be doing a financial service company if you listen to me, but maybe you did not or you're interested in financial service companies. This should give you a template for a bank, an investment bank. I wanted to get a beta for Deutsche Bank. I broke it down into two businesses, commercial banking and investment banking. So when you break it down to two businesses, I don't know why this table is up there. No. Two businesses, the question is, you know, go if you did exactly what we did in the, in the other examples, you go find other commercial banks, pure commercial banks. And already you can see you don't want to bring in mixed banks into the money center banks are all mixes of businesses. You're probably looking at smaller commercial banks and pure investment banks, which there are a few of. I got the average beta across those companies. And then I took a weighted average of those two of the average betas. What's the step I missed or skipped? Because in the case of Disney, I got the average beta and then I unlevered and relevered, right? Why am I not doing that for a bank? Do banks have debt? Immense amounts of debt, but they don't use it as capital. It's raw material, right? How does a traditional bank make money? It borrows money at 4%, it lends it out 5%. Debt to a bank is not capital, it's raw material. When you look at banks, when you talk about capital, it's always equity capital. That's basically the only capital. It's a frame of reference you have to bring to when you look at banks. There's no such thing as a cost of capital for a bank. It's just cost of equity and you're done. Yeah. So, semantics, that simply means debt It basically means that the debt to equity ratio is set by regulation. Because if I let you go do whatever you want as a bank and you make money by borrowing money and lending it at a higher rate, you're going to keep borrowing and borrowing. But whose money are you lending? It's depositors' money, right? So in a sense, I have to protect depositors. So what does every banking regulation around the world do? It puts limits on how much. It basically puts limits on you need this much equity to continue as a bank. That's what regulatory capital ratios are. The requirement that your equity be a certain percentage of your overall capital, of your overall assets as a so it's not that the debt to equity ratio is low. It's actually very high. We're not we're not sure what is debt and what's so it's not it's not capital in the sense that it's capital to a non bank. So that's why you focus just on equity. Manish. So, if they have buildings and offices and offices. It doesn't matter. Wrong side of the balance sheet, right? But they borrow money to build all those. That shouldn't matter here, yeah. right? So in a sense, if you're if you're bought, it's going to be such. I mean, take J.P. Morgan, two seventy seven Park. They might actually own that building, right? You saying could be a lot of debt, but if you think about the market cap of J.P. Morgan, you think about that debt. It's you know, it's it's not really debt for their operations. It's debt for basically the physical assets they own. So it's not going to make a big difference. So when you when you look at a bank, just it actually makes your life easier, right? You take the businesses, you break them down, and it gives you different costs of equity then for your investment banking business and your commercial banking business. We notice 
for Deutsche, the cost of equity for investment banking was higher than the cost of equity for commercial banking. And this has always been true. The problem is banks like to lecture other companies on how they should use different cost of capital by business. But when you look inside, banks for the last 40 years have really treated the businesses as if they were equivalent risk. And they've allocated capital based on that basis. So guess which business grows Every year, if you look at the last 40 years, you've got a risky business and a safe business. You assign the same cost of equity, the risky business is going to get bigger. And this is why the investment banking arms, and I'm including trading and other segments in there, will increase at the expense of traditional commercial banking. It's not for the right reasons. You're doing it because you're subsidizing until finally the commercial bank just ceases to exist. Any questions on the mechanics of bottom-up beta? So, that's how you get the beta for a publicly traded company. Break it down to businesses. So now that the quiz is behind you, go back and look at the annual report for your company, look at the businesses they're in. And you don't have to do the entire bottom up beta. You're welcome to use my industry average betas if you need to, this is not. But I would suggest you at least take a small sample and test out whether you can do it on your own. It's not difficult to do, but there are steps involved that are, yes. On the previous slide. Yep. Uh, just uh, when, when we're talking about how these banks don't have public debt to actually reserve the debt. It's not that they don't. I'm saying there is debt, but you can't. So here's the challenge. Pick up a city, the city group's balance sheet. I challenge you to tell me how much on the liability side of the balance sheet is traditional debt. Because you're going to see all kinds of crap, right? Repurchase agreement showing up on both sides. It's an absolute mess figuring out even what is debt. And even when you when you catch that debt, it's not clear where that debt is going. Is it raw material that you use to make money when you make out loans, or is it debt as a source of capital? And I was thinking just more from a macro conceptual mm -hmm. component of the risk profile, like commercial banking versus investment banking. My initial thinking was with debt not being viewed the same as you're doing it. Right. With companies, I think it's Wrong, but it can be investment banking makes money on deals, right? Deals are heavily cyclical. Commercial banking, you make money on loans. Loans are not as cyclical. It's not that they're not. But if you look at just the total revenues you get from deal making, you'll see huge swings. Same thing with the trading. So if you plot out over time, the the re so let's say the revenue line item or from you know from the revenues for a bank are basically the net of interest income minus interest expenses on loans versus trading income. It's a trading income that causes huge swings. It's a deal making income that has huge swings. That's why there's more risk. And the more I play this game, the risk. So even within investment banking, there are gradations of risk. And guess what you're going to keep doing if you if you play this game of your one cost of equity? You're going to keep moving into riskier and riskier and riskier segments in investment banking because I'm not charging you a sufficient price when you invest your capital there. You're going to be taking these investments. And over time, not only are you going to be in investment banking, you're going to be in the riskier segments of investment banking. So now let's talk about what to do if you have a company that's not traded. As I said, this is going to be an issue if you have to value a division. Remember for uh, Bali, I showed you the four businesses they were in. One of them was a logistics business. About seven years ago, two years after I did that table, Vale sold their logistics business. So let's say you're the person who's been hired to assess the value of the logistics business. The beta you would use would not be the beta for Vale as a company, the beta you estimate for the logistics business. That's one place where you have to get a beta by looking at bottom-up betas. But it goes further than that. We talked about Reddit for an IPO. How do you get a beta? Again, bottom-up betas. So when you look at betas for private businesses, you're not going to have the regression beta route available to you. So I'm going to give you two ways in which people estimate betas for private companies. One is an approach that I've, you know, that looks good on paper, but it's really difficult to get meaningful numbers on. It's true that private companies don't have fast prices, but private companies have financial statements, right? And in the financial statements, they report the earnings they made as a company year after year, quarter after quarter. 
There is a beta called an accounting beta. What's an accounting beta? Instead of regressing returns on a stock against returns on a market index, you regress changes in earnings for a company against changes in earnings across all companies in the market. Question? I'm sorry. Go ahead. In a, not just in cost of equity, in pretty much everything. It's it's perspective, right? So if I asked you what is a typical margin for a software company, it's very difficult than the typical margin for a manufacturing company. So it's not just cost of equity. On every single metric, it's good to get perspective. So to help me out, how do we get perspective? Well, my question was, it's like the business data. Right, but the... But within a business, what will cause the cost of equity to be different then? Levels of debt. In a bank, in the banking business, we've kind of locked ourselves in. And this is a little troublesome that basically we use the levered beta for every bank. We're saying all banks have the same cost of equity. Okay. So one of the things you might argue is maybe banks need to be broken down into large banks and small banks, well-capitalized banks and undercapitalized, because that's what you worry about at the bank. Are you fully capitalized? How close are you to regulatory capital ratios? And nothing stops you when you do bottom-up betas for banks. Say, I have a small regional bank. I'm going to look at the betas for small regional banks, right? So you can use the same techniques we use to do bottom-up betas for companies, but you still say lever. You can't do the unlevering and the relevering, but differences then across banks will depend on whether you're regional or money center whether you're small or large, whether you're well-capitalized or undercapitalized. And that's perfectly reasonable. And it's a good question to ask, why do banks have different costs of equity? Banks get into trouble. It's not because their cost of equity gets really high. It's because they've screwed up on the deposit side and their deposits are escaping and leaving and they're in a, in a bad shape, in bad shape. So let's talk, yeah, go so any other questions on banks? So let that kind of, and you can already see why I try to steer you away from financial service companies for purpose of this class, because you get to get to cost of equity and the rest of the discussion becomes smooth. What's your cost of debt? What's your cost of capital for a bank? But let's talk about how to get, so in an accounting beta, you take changes in earnings for your company and regress it against changes in earnings for the S&P 500. It sounds reasonable, right? The slope of the line is the beta. But tell me the statistical problems with using changes in earnings instead of stock price returns. Change. At best, you have four, four, four observations every year. So if your private company has been in existence five years, you have 20 observations in your regression. You're saying, so what? If you ever run a regression with 20 observations, it's incredibly noisy. That standard error becomes much larger. Second, who estimates earnings? Accountants at companies, right? And I'm not, you know, I'm not picking on accountants. What do accountants do? They tend to smooth things out for the best of reasons, right? So if you have a big expense, they'll spread it out over time. By definition, then your accounting earnings are going to understate the true risk in your company because accountants are smoothing things out. I've run accounting earnings regressions. I've never used an accounting earnings beta. Why? Because the number doesn't make any sense. It's smoothed out. Every company looks like it has a beta of one. Not because they're all equally risky, but because I'm using a metric that's difficult to compute on a continuous basis, impossible, and accountants smooth out things. So almost by default, I'm stuck with the bottom-up beta approach. So let's talk about how you'd go about estimating the bottom-up beta for a private business. Remember the company I did not mention in my previous examples, we did Tata Motors, we did Baidu, we did Deutsche Bank, we did Disney, we did Vale. But the sixth business that I talked about very early in the class that I haven't mentioned yet, Bookscape, that privately owned independent bookstore. In fact, uh, the origins of this company being in the book uh, can be traced back to a day, I think 20 something years ago, sitting in my office. And this person pops into my office unannounced, now, which is fine. Now. And she said, I he hear you teach valuation. I said, no, I'm a marketing professor. She did not believe me. And she said, you know what, I have this bookstore and I need to get, you know, I, I'm, and she said, I'm facing 
a life or death decision. My reaction was, maybe the mafia is attacking. You talk to the FBI. And she said, no, no, it's not that life and death. There's a new Barnes and Noble opening a few blocks away from me. And remember, this was the day when Barnes and Noble was in its pathway to glory opening everywhere. And she said, I've owned this bookstore through my family for 60 years. A grandfather had created the bookstore. She was sec the third generation running the bookstore. And she said, I'm facing a decision of whether to fight or flee. Again, she's using language that suggests an existential crisis and said, what's the choice you're facing? She said, I can fight. I can put in a cappuccino bar and redesign my bookstore to compete with Barnes and Noble because they have all that stuff. Or I can flee. I can get out of this lease. I have a really good long-term lease and my lessor is willing to you know, let me out of the lease. In fact, he will pay me a couple of million dollars to walk away. That's a flee decision. I said, I still don't see what I have to do with this. She said, if I decide to fight, I have to take the rest of my savings. This is the key word, rest of my savings and put it into the bookstore. I said, okay. I said, I need to know how much of a return I need to make on that money. This is the rest of my savings. In other words, without saying the word, what was she looking for? What is my hurdle rate? Do I need to demand 20%, 15%? You're saying, how the heck have you run a business for 60 years without a hurdle rate? You'd be surprised how many private businesses were created 30, 40, 50 years ago. Somebody made a decision then. They're running almost on autopilot. They haven't had to make a big investment in decades. And she said, can you help me? I said, I think I can. And she gave me, you know, I think she gave me a coupon for the bookstore, like $50 or something. I took it. No. I said, I'll call you tomorrow. So I went looking for publicly traded bookstores, book retailers, and I ran into a problem. I found a couple. So this is actually the updated version. It looked very similar, like two bookstores that were publicly traded. And I said, this isn't going to be enough. So I followed the set, the other device of going up and down the food chain. I said, essentially, I'm going to look for companies in the book business. Here's my definition of comparable companies. They do well when you do well. They do badly when you do bad. That's basically what, I, what comparable means. So if you're a bookstore and you're doing well, I can almost guarantee you publishers are doing well as well because where do they make their money? They make At that time, everybody bought through bookstores. Today, it might be a different question you're asking because Amazon is so heavily dominant in the book retailing business, but that time is all books. So at the end, I had about 11 firms in there. You see, that's still a small sample for $50. That's about all the work I was willing to do. So I went in, I got the betas. I, I did every, everything I did for Disney. So the process stays the same, right? Average, median. So basically I ended up with an unlevered beta of being for being a book company, a 0.72 and cleaning up for cash, I ended up with an unlevered beta for being in the book business of 0.7584. The last two decimals again overkill, but about 0.76. Now, what did I do for Disney after I got the unlevered beta for the business? I levered it using what? Debt to equity defined how? Total debt divided by? Market equity. Now, do you see the challenge here? You're looking at an independent bookstore. I can get debt. The total debt is easy, but there is no market equity. You can use book equity, but that's not going to lead you to a good place. So I called the owner and I said, do you have a target debt to equity ratio? She said, a target what? It kind of answered my question. Because if she said my target debt to equity ratio is 40%, I would put the 40% and moved on. I have never got an answer that it makes any sense with the private business because they don't, I mean, you don't think in market equity terms. You say, I have this much debt. This is why it took. So I was stuck. So I made an assumption. I assumed that Bookscape as a bookstore has to operate at a debt to equity ratio roughly similar to other publicly traded companies in the space. You see what I'm saying, right? You start a pharmacy and a slash you know, retail store, you're going to have to lease your buildings just like CVS and Dwayne Reed Re do. So your business is your business. It's an assumption. I use the debt to equity ratio of the industry of 21.4%. That gave me a levered beta of 086 I thought I was home. 
right? I've got non-levered beta, I use the industry average. You plug in the levered beta, the cost of equity I got was seven and a half percent. And I almost called her and gave her this number when there was another stopping point. And here's what I wanted to think about, right? When you're a publicly traded company, what does beta measure? The risk you cannot diversify away. We use it to get a cost of equity. And our rationale is the rest of the risk in this business is going to get diversified away. By whom? Not by the company, but by the marginal investors in the company. The Black Rocks, the State Streets, the Vanguards of the world. Who's the only investor in this company? The owner. And what did she say about fighting, she was going to take the rest of her savings and put it, she was the exact opposite of diversified, right? Her entire wealth is started the company. And she's not alone. Most private business owners are almost entirely invested in their own business. You're a doctor. The bulk of your wealth is tied up in your medical practice. Why? Because how do you have extra money to keep, maybe as you get older, you might have, you know, other money you might save. But private business people tend to be concentrated. So I have a question, and this is actually a question that is about logic. So when I focus on beta, I focus on the risk that you cannot diversify, where the 7.5% reflects at risk. If this person is not diversified, they're exposed to the rest of the risk, I want a directional answer. Will my cost of equity for this person be higher or lower? It should be higher because they look at the rest of the risk. It's an algebra problem. If I could, instead of looking at the beta, look at the total risk in this company, I might have a shot at estimating a cost of equity. And about 30 years ago, I was wrestling with this question. I would remember I was talking to a bunch of private business appraisers. And I said, what do you guys do about this? All your numbers come from publicly traded companies. You have to value private companies and you know the owners are not diversified. The seven and a half percent you get is too low. What do you do? And they said, we just add 10%. We call it a company-specific risk premium. I said, you can't keep making up crap like this and just adding it on. Unfortunately, that's the state of the art in appraisal. There is this number, which, which whenever I see it terrifies me, called a company-specific risk premium, which the appraiser basically makes up to get to a number that he or she wants to get to. This, that doesn't work for me. I know I need to add something, but it can't be arbitrary and it can't be the same for every company. So I went back to that regression from which I got a beta and I looked up another statistic. Remember when I showed you the Bloomberg regression, I showed you the raw beta, I showed you this, but I also showed you an R squared, right? What did we say the R squared measures? The proportion of the variance in the stock that is explained by the market. The regression is telling me how much of the risk in this company comes from the market. It's also by extension telling me how much is company specific. If I can bring that in to my beta, I will have a beta that captures your risk as a completely undiversified investor. So here's what I did. I took the market beta that I got and I said, look, I'm going to look at only the portion of that market risk that is beta, and I'm going to scale it up to capture the rest of the risk. You see, what's the square root of the R squared? Obviously, it's the R, which is statistically the correlation. You're saying, why are you take doing the correlation? Because the R squared goes with variance. Beta is a standard deviation method. So that's purely statistical again. You divide the market beta by the correlation, you come up with a measure that I call total beta. Why did I call it total beta? To differentiate from a market beta. This beta captures total risk. It's going to be much higher than the market beta. And intuitively, I brought in the risk that I'd assumed to be diversified away into the beta. Not surprisingly, I ended up with a much higher beta. So the, I'm going from 0.75 or 0.8 something to 1.68, which also gives me a much higher cost of equity. So I called the owner and I said, look, I've got a hurdle rate for you, at least for your equity investment. You've got to make at least 12%. And then she asked me two questions. The first was easy to answer. The second I knew the answer to, but I could not think of a kind way of giving the answer. The first question she asked was, Barnes & Noble is a publicly traded book retailer. They're two blocks away from me. What's their cost of equity? What's the answer to that? They're publicly traded, their investors are diversified. I can use a beta and I end up with a cost of equity of seven and a half to 8%, right? 
So I said, it's about 8%. And then she asked me the second question. You could see it coming. She said, if my cost of equity is 12% and Barnes and Noble's cost of equity is 8%, how the heck am I going to compete with them in the long term? What's the answer to that? You cannot. It's a... It's basically a challenge when you run a private business. You can be the most efficient private, you work a lot harder than the man of a public company, but you're taking risk inefficiently. You're exposing yourself to risk that they don't have to expose themselves to, your cost of effort. You can try to make up for that difference, but over time, it almost always will win out. Here's how it shows up. Talked about CVS and Dwayne Reed. You remember, you know, if you go back 40 years in the U.S., you walked into a pharmacy, almost every pharmacy was a private loan. The pharmacist who stood behind the counter was often the owner of the pharmacy. Today, it's almost entirely dominated by publicly traded companies. You go business by business, you're going to see this phenomenon play out. And you know it's, where it's coming from? The biggest business where private owners used to dominate was real estate. The longest time, real estate was localized, was run by developers, were not diversified. Guess who the biggest real estate owner in the country is right now? It's BlackRock. You're getting private equity, you're getting institutional investors, and it's not because they understand real estate better, but they can buy a houses in Detroit, houses in Atlanta, houses in LA, and let the law of large numbers work in their favor. Whereas if you're an Atlanta-based developer, you're exposed to Atlanta-specific risk. You bring that into your cap rates and your hurdle rates, you can't compete with them. It essentially is going to drive out private ownership. And that troubles people. And it should, right? Because we have a vision of mom and pop stores with the owners behind and effectively, this means that over time, you're going to be dealing with corporate entities. You know, the other area this is coming to, it's already come in. It's, if you think about how medical practices used to be structured 30 or 40 years ago, they were owned by doctors and dentists. Increasingly across the country, they're getting rolled up into entities that if they're not publicly traded, are often invested in by private equity. We can debate the side costs of doing this, but it, you can see it happening because of the differences in risk efficiencies across the different ownership structures. So what I'd like you to do, yeah, go ahead. Okay. If, if you think about it, R squared, and you look at how an R squared is constructed, it's a percentage of the variance in your stock that is not explained by the market. That's what, that's what the uh, statistical R squared measures. It's a variance measure. Beta is a standard deviation method. Standard deviation of the stock multiplied by the correlation. In fact, that's how the, cover, the beta is calculated in a regression. It's standard deviation of the stock times the correlation divided by standard deviation of the market. So it's almost just plain algebra. You move the correlation to the other side, you end up with a relative standard deviation number. That's what the total beta is. And what I'm saying is you're exposed to all of the standard deviation in the stock now, not just the portion of that standard deviation that's market-driven. Go ahead. So would you say it's a pretty good generalization to say that most private companies, if not all of them, have higher cost of equity than Probably. And the way private business owners make up for it is, what, what are the reasons then private businesses stay in business? One is this emotional dividends, right? It's your business. Your, you know that if you took the capital invest in your business, you invest in an index fund, you could probably make higher money. But you get an emotional dividend from running your business. The only problem with emotional dividends is the people who get it tend to be the people who started it. And you know when that emotional dividend connection breaks down is when they get to be 75 years old and the next generation. So often this break will happen when you have a generational shift in ownership. Okay. The second is maybe you're in a niche business where public companies really don't feel there's enough room. In them. I know there's a mystery bookstore in New York City and I don't know whether it's still around. You walked in, the owner behind the counter owned the store. She'd read every single book in the store. 
So if you came in and you said, you know what, I like John Gresham, she said, have you tried this? Try that at a Barnes and Noble. You walk to the cashier and say, I like this book. And they say, buy it. You say, is there any other books like it? There are lots of books that look just like it. Take any one you want. Now they have a big stack right up in front. There are businesses where there's a personal service component which might lead them. So don't lose hope yet. There's still hope for private businesses, but they're going to get pushed into. Now, I, I, you know, I was last time I was in India. I actually, you know, grew up in in a city where there's a lot of small stores all over. Be amazed at how many of those stores now have private equity investors invested in them. The small you know, the hole in the wall store. They've sold off 30% of the business to private equity investors who collect the income. And this is almost inexorable around the world that you're going to get this play out. Justin? Yeah. yeah. So in a sense, it's the same pure play question. So if you have a niche business, the question you got to ask yourself, what are the other companies that do well when I do well? Right? So that's a tough question to answer anywhere. The private business may be particularly difficult to answer. Yes. Performance is a numerator effect. Don't make the discount rate. I mean, the way I describe discount rates is they cannot be receptacles for all your hopes and fears, right? You feel good about a company, you can't lower the discount rate. Give them higher margins, give them. So in a sense, if you want to bring performance in, bring it into the numerator. This is a market price of risk. It has nothing to do with your company in terms of performance. Last question. Essentially, the only way that it can complete is that we have to better have to go later. Exactly. Okay, so I will see you on Wednesday. I had emailed you about finding a group. I'm still looking for a group. Um, okay. I don't know if